Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Aishwarya Srikant, the structural engineer at EXP, about her journey into getting a PhD and her transition to the structural engineering industry, as well as advancements in bridge monitoring systems, uh, integration of machine learning and structural engineering, and the unique challenges challenges based in offshore structural engineering as well. I'm your host, Matt Picardle. And before we get started, here's a quick word from our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a Kaplan company. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. Aish, welcome to the show. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what got you into structural engineering in the first place? Hi, Matt. Uh, thank you so much for having me in the show. And I'm really excited to talk with you and uh, be share my experiences through this podcast. So I am one of those lucky individuals born in a, a family of engineers. My father was a industrial engineer and my mom herself was a civil structural engineer. So I had that advantage, uh, I would say, and I uh, had a very positive environment in terms of anything that I wanted to pursue, any book that I wanted to read, anything. All my uh, ambitions were given, uh, were fueled by, by my parents. And uh, also I was lucky enough to have very, very good mentors and teacher, teachers throughout my journey, starting from my schooling to even until now. So I decided to do pursue uh, civil engineering when I was in 10th grade. I was really fascinated. Some of the textbooks that I read from my mom's bookshelf, I liked the building materials. Just for fun, I was reading that during a weekend and I, it just interested me a lot. And also during my 11th and 12th grade, I really loved physics and math and especially in physics, all those chapters on Young's modulus and all, all those laboratory uh, tests that we do, all those really interested me a lot. And uh, that made, I want to say that uh, kind of made clear to me that, okay, this is the route I need to take and this is what I want to pursue. And then uh, after finishing my high school, I joined my bachelor's in civil engineering in uh, an university, College of Engineering, Gindi, in my home country in India. And then while pursuing my bachelor's, I got an opportunity to do a double master's degree program with a very reputed French engineering school. So I did my third and fourth year of my bachelor's there in uh, in Ecole Centrale de Nantes in, the, in, uh, in France. And uh, after that, I finishing completing that, I came back to my university and pursued master's in structural engineering for another two years. And during this, my education as anybody, any other student, I also had like a couple of internships in structural engineering. And my master's thesis was on offshore structures. I got interested in that line for some reason. I do not know. I just picked that topic for my thesis. And then uh, I decided to work on it. And uh, I had an internship with TechNIP, a short internship with TechNIP. And also, uh, I think a two-month internship with FAU, Florida Atlantic University. That's where I met my professor, advisor for my PhD. So after finishing my uh, internship there at FAU, I did an application for my PhD uh, when I was there. And um, after com after completing that, I uh, pursued an internship again after graduation. I pursued one year internship with the National Institute of Ocean Technology while I was waiting to join my PhD program. So I was actively working there for almost a year. And then I joined FAU uh, with Professor Arup Yasami, who's a bridge expert. And uh, I pursued my PhD program with him. And after completing that, uh, I got into my first job at EXP Services, 
and uh, I'm currently working for EXP as a structural engineer. So this is my story in short. Awesome. Yeah, yeah there, was, there was a lot in there. That was some, some great stuff that I wanted to ask you about. So EXP right now, so you're in Florida at the moment. Is that correct? I'm actually stationed in Canada. Okay, Canada. Gotcha. Yes, yes. I was in Florida. I started my career in, I mean, with EXP in Florida, their um, uh, office in Florida. I, I started with them uh, in uh, in the U.S. And then after that, I recently moved to Canada a couple of years back, and I'm still continuing to work with them. EXP, they have branches both in the U.S. and Canada, and I'm still continuing to work for my U.S. teams from here. Awesome. Yeah, I think it was it was from the beginning of your story. I think it was great that parents says, what was it? They supported you in what you wanted to do. Uh, I think your your dad was an engineer, so that kind of inspired you. But then you kind of went into the the civil side of it, and they just encouraged you and, and gave you books. I think that's pretty cool. I think my parents did the same. I know my mom wanted me to be a nurse at one point. But I was like, I do not want to be. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't deal with it in terms of uh of that aspect of things and. I just didn't like blood at all. So I was like, mom, I'm not going to be a good nurse. But then she, yeah, she was, then she went ahead and supported me and whatever I wanted to do. So nice. it's, it's, yeah, grateful for the parents to to be able to do that. And then you also, did you always want to go to the U.S. when you were pursuing civil engineering? Was that like a long-term goal of it or, or what type of work did you want to do? And where did you picture yourself back then? Honestly we speaking, college? I had, honestly speaking, I never had a, particular ambition of this is where I want to stay and this is where I want to live or this is I didn't have a very clear idea on that I just went with the flow in in some sense and uh, I just uh, I mean one thing was sure in me whatever I do I want to give my best so during my master's thesis I got an opportunity to do an internship with FAU with under Professor R.P. Sami, so I completed that. And organically, there was a position available. They were expecting a funding uh, from the Transportation Research Board. They were looking for a research and teaching assistant there, and I tried to apply uh, and keep for my PhD program. And uh, it, it just happened very organically. And um, uh, I really enjoyed working on my master's thesis and getting reading a lot of papers doing literature review digging out things and framing uh trying to identify new problems and proposing new solutions i really enjoyed all that uh during my master's thesis and that motivated me to pursue a phd program and i came in, came to us that's how it happened yeah, it looks like you're you're kind of just following your passions. Like this next thing looks cool, masters looks cool. Let's let's go yep. into that. And then you meet. Yeah, it looks like your professor, and that was a PhD opportunity. Oh, that that looks really interesting. Let me get into that. And then job opportunities after your your PhD program. And then you're 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 pretty much just following whatever comes up and what looks really interesting. So I think that's a that's a cool way to live life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as far me it has been that way. Yes, so I just do a particular thing at a given moment and try we try to give our best and that path leads to the next step it i mean we can think 100 things okay i want to do that do that do this but ultimately uh, our actions itself will show us the path that's that's what i believe in yeah yeah doing the best at what you're currently doing will lead to more opportunities yep what encouraged you to get your phd because i know that's i'm sure you knew it was that's going to be a long process do i want to I guess, how did you go about making that decision to do a PhD versus, oh, maybe I should get into the industry? Again, it's it's driven by what happened during my master's and the thesis. And uh, uh, my master's thesis really went well, and I performed really well in the, in what, in the topic that I chose. And um, I really enjoyed working in research at that point of time. And I thought, okay, let, let me go into that. Let me go deep into a, a problem and solve it and see how it looks like. And, uh, and and honestly speaking, I didn't have a very uh, confusion on, oh, should I go to the industry now or should I go to the PhD? No, I was very clear at that time, no, next step for me is PhD. Then after that, what do I do? Very academic route or industry route that we will take look at it a little later when the time comes. So at that time, at that point of time, it was very clear in me that I wanted to pursue a PhD after my master's. And what was that transition like? going from academia to uh, the industry i know i think it's a it's it's rough for a lot of people how was it for you how did school prepare or not prepare you for the industry (laughs) 
it's a good question good point and i used to talk about this with my colleagues and friends too so academic world we learn a lot of things and we do a bachelor's we do a masters we do a lot of courses and when we think we we are great and we know a lot of things and when we get, go into an industry and we start solving a problem hey where do i start how do i how do where do i start how do i solve this problem and there are too many aspects to look at too many things to look at which we really not necessarily learn at school because it's just not practically possible for us to learn everything that we learn from in uh, in our work at school so the school has a particular what to say um aim and objective introducing us to the different topics introducing us to all the concepts and fundamentals gives us all the fundamentals so that we take that to the industry and we uh, serve the industry uh with what we learned so i would say it was not an easy transition at all for me as well couple of months it took some time for me to adapt like for example in phd you re- or in research in general you go really in detail really in depth to a problem but we don't necessarily need to do the same thing while performing a calculation we do a lot by an estimate we we do a preliminary estimate and we and then we take a little finer steps we don't need to really dwell in um, too much detail into a particular stuff right at the beginning so it's it's a little different approach i felt and um i think the school prepares you enough for you to be able to adapt and transition into the industry that's what i felt so we can't expect the school to give you all the experience in possible but whatever we learn again whatever we learn at school if we if we have learned it properly if we have put the effort to understand and learn whatever we have been uh, we have been given i think that will help us to transition into the industry comfortably relatively uh definitely the first couple of months it's a, it's a different type of thinking and uh, uh and a different perspective towards how you look at the problem when compared to solving a research problem and at hand in academia so that's what i felt so it the transition was not too hard but it was a little hard for me for the first couple of months and then once after that point of time then it was okay yeah, yeah how how about yourself i mean after finishing masters to your first job how did you feel so it was definitely yeah it was definitely i say it was tough but i think cuz so for me i had my under it was different for me so i had my undergrad at cal poly pomona and that's where it's a it's that's more hands on base which was great cuz our design classes let's say we take a concrete class we'll get into the theory but half the time we're we're designing things we're designing columns the way designers engineers would design columns uh, out in the real world uh, so it was a, definitely a lot more practical and a lot of design experience with that so that was great but then i also got my masters at at uc san diego and i could definitely see the differences the teaching philosophies where a cal poly would be really practical hands on here's what you're going to do in the industry so and then comparing that to my my education at UCSD i don't think i got to design something on my masters uh, until about a year in so all mm-hmm. of that first year was theoretical stuff uh research uh, which was great at the end of it looking back i think having both of those yes. uh, really prepared me for that transfer because yeah practicality is good but knowing why the codes are like that that research based portion i think that's pretty essential too so for me uh the Cal Poly Pomona stuff really prepared me for the design work but then it was still a big learning curve there's so much in the industry that you don't know especially details the detailing right. what's the most cost efficient effective way practical ways to construct things that's a whole new can of worms that yeah they definitely don't have time to teach you but I think at least knowing the fundamentals, right? The statics, dynamics, uh, mechanics and Shut materials. materials. Yeah. Yeah, so if the universities at least teach us that, the industry will get you there. Hopefully we you know we'll, we'll learn from our mentors and and on the job and as long as right. we know the fundamentals, I think we can get through it. Like we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll just <laughs> it'd be nice if we had some more design experience too. <laughs> to make it a yeah. little easier. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, and And then what was your research based off of was it the offshore stuff or was that later on offshore structures it was on for, for my master's thesis in my phd i did 
uh, something on bridges. It was on developing bridge deterioration models, which essentially models the structural components to to see how the the condition of the bridge evolves over its lifespan. And um, it's a part of life cycle assessment. So the life cycle assessment of a bridge structure depends on the deterioration models, not just both the material side, the material models, as well as the, the as a structural component itself. So I was dealing, it's, it's more driven on, it's a more a data driven approach. So I utilized uh, national bridge inventory data, which is available for public. I utilize that for my research to develop these models. And um, yes, so it was, it was focused on bridges, my PhD. So you were doing the, yeah, I guess for the PhD, was that a, could you tell us more about that in terms of what you were trying to to research in terms of maybe the advantages of the benefits of your research? Yeah, I guess what we'll, were the benefits of your research that you were hoping to to get from it so that could help the industry? Sure. So the benefits of this research is, first of all, um, we want to understand how a particular bridge uh, condition evolves over a time and why we need to know that information is because we need to plan for their maintenance so imagine you have so many thousands of bridges in a state now how do you go about okay which which bridges i have to go uh, how much money i need to allocate uh, and which bridges i need to go and uh, uh, look first how much i need to prioritize so to answer all those questions we need deterioration models um so you Basically, these models utilize the inspection data, which has been collected uh, by annually, normally in the U.S. for most of the bridges. So every two years, they do a bridge inspection and, and the bridge inspectors uh, give a rating. Uh, and we have all that information and we know the evolution of, of this condition over, over its lifetime. So what, once we know that data for so many thousands of bridges now, the, all that information along with its input parameters such as uh, what is the how many spans are there? How where is this bridge located? Is it in a coastline near a coastline or in inland, or uh, what type of material it is, is it? And uh, when was it constructed? How many years old was it? And uh, how many repairs were done on this particular bridge? So all this information will be feeding into these models and to be able to give as an idea of when we can do a preventive maintenance, how much money to allocate for uh, our. Um, maintenance of these bridges. So that's the benefit of these models. And why research on this is because currently we are still trying to improve these deterioration models for having a the better the the robustness of these models, the better is our judgment and the better is our the amount that we are allocating for repairing these bridges and the decisions that we take based on these models itself. So that's where my research comes in. So how a robust we can make the deterioration models, how we can eliminate some of the biases, how many how we can simplify some of these as well for for someone to be able to take these ideas and to apply them. So this is where the benefit of my research comes in. Yeah, that I so because I know the ASCE report card. Uh, if if you read that, like we got like a C minus or something. Yep. It's it's not great, especially with the the bridges too. And with these deteriorate these deterioration models, it looks like we can get a better understanding when we need to repair them or maybe the long-term lifespan of a bridge, how much are we actually pre- anticipating that we're going to repair it? So maybe more of a, a better schedule for repairs, a yes. better budget. So that, yeah, it's really important work. And yep. so for me, the PhD always seemed like a daunting task. Was it as daunting as you, you thought it was going to be like when you were first signing up for it? Yeah. Because I was like, if I was, would I even be able to get it? Or <laughs> what was your thinking going to it? Well, um, the PhD has a lot of ups and downs. At least initially, until you you really figure out, okay, this is what this is going to be my contribution. This is what I want to do, and this is how I will do it. Until you get that point, at least it's it's a rough ride, and that's where your advisor and uh, your interactions with the advisor really helps in, and uh, the more frequent. The interactions and more, uh, what to say, uh, consistent effort we put in and the more we talk through and we get advice on, uh, the better we progress. So I, it was a rough ride for quite a bit of time until we get to this stage. And then after that, after that point is reached, then you know what what it involves and where we need to 
focus on and how we need to approach this problem and how we want to finish the problem. Finishing is also an important pro- important thing. We keep on diverging in, in different areas. We look at different topics. Yeah, that looks interesting. Yeah, this looks interesting. Let me try that. Let me try this. And everything adds on time, every every effort. And you see some, you read some papers and you find something interesting. You can think, okay, maybe I can try this. And then we get, you get and try, you work on that and you see that, okay, this is good. Maybe I need to look at some other aspect of it. You go on another paper, go another journal. You get some ideas from that and you try. So it's it's a it's a kind of a time consuming process. And one challenge initially is how to nail down on what you really want to do, how you really want to do. Uh, until that stage, it was enough, right? And after that, I think it, it was okay. Yeah, <laughs> but, you're, you're, it seems like the scope can be as, as big as you want it in terms of when you're doing that yes. initial research. Yes. Then with all that research, how do I condense it so I can actually uh, there was something complete useful. the PhD? <laughs> yeah. Yes, because so many things are there. But out of it, it's like a concoction, right, of, of so many things there. How, how what what small contribution you can do into that field so sure. so yeah that's that's where the challenge is and that's that's what makes it interesting too yeah it seems like it was a creative process too yes. in terms of you have all all these things how are you going to put it together what makes sense and how it can help and from what i understand once you do all that research it's up to your advisor when they know that you're ready to defend it right yeah advisors then... as well as the the committee members uh, we we always have a doctoral committee. Like I think in a, even in masters, I, I'm I, I'm not sure whether in US there is a some committee. Of them, some of yeah, them have sometimes. a committee. Okay, so yeah, majorly it is the advisor, but also we get in inputs from the committee members and the committee members. They so they have been with you in 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 bits and pieces in your journey. Whenever you meet and you present, they have not been with you throughout the journey. Throughout the journey is your advisor, but they come and see. They come. And look at your presentation and they, from their perspective they and their experience, they give some ideas and they say, why can't you try this? And then you get all those inputs in the committee meeting. And I think everything contributes, every each and every discussion contributes, every single thing that you that you think about and you interact, even if you talk about something to your friend and your friend, hey, that, that's an interesting thing. Maybe you should you look at that. Maybe that particular state has so many bridges. Maybe you have to take some data from that state also. So all the small little conversations that we that we have with our family members, with our friends, with our advisor, with our committee members, everything has an impact on your work. I feel, and every and everything together progresses you towards towards that end goal of getting a PhD. It's not like a one person thing. It's 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 a lot of things that happen in the background. Yeah, a lot of people help you out, give you some advice, give you some pointers or some insights, and all culminates into the. The defense, and they call it a defense, right? Does it feel like you're defending yourself, or is it more like, okay, we know you're ready, or uh, yeah, is, does it feel like, oh, I need to defend myself, or is it, no, I, I prepared so much, this, I'm going to get it. How, how, yeah, how does that feel? I think it's a combination of both because you know that you have worked on it, and you know that you, you by the time of your defense, you already have a couple of publications, and uh, and you have enough idea. Of, and knowledge and skills on what you have done because you have done that for so many years. So, but the, the different part of it comes is is def, it's it's still there. That you will be bombarded with questions by the by the committee members, and um, sometimes it might be a perspective, little not you have you have you might not have seen it in that way, your own problem. But they might ask you a question in in, in that particular aspect of it, and you need to think of that answer and see how you can relate your work to that particular question so it's still a defense it, there will be questions that you don't expect will come on the mm. uh in the, in the defense time but in, inside you you know that you have done the work you know <laughs> that you have been through the journey so you can tell them you can uh defend that so yeah yeah it just goes to show all the hard work that you put in there's a reason why you're up there and it's yeah it's, it seems like you would prepare so much you put your your work into it and then at the end, you'll be ready. You'll yeah, you'll you be will, able to defend you, you it. can uh, you can manage and you can uh, answer them. And uh, yeah, yeah. What were some of the 
for your masters, I remember you mentioned the offshore stuff. Was there any were there any particular things that of, of interest for offshore structures that really stood out to you from that experience or lessons learned from that? Sorry, I didn't understand your question fully. What did you ask me? Oh, so you did your your masters on the offshore, right? Yeah, on offshore structures. Yes. What was interesting about that, or or what stood out for you for to get to the like? Why did you pick offshore, and what did you learn from it? Honestly speaking. I really do not know why I chose the topic. I was, <laughs> I was, I was looking, looking at so many topics on uh, so many things. What to do? You need to choose. You need to come up with a topic, and you need to give an abstract and stuff, right? With the with yeah. your uh, professor. So I just wanted to do something different. That's all. I just wanted to do something. It's not that uh, buildings and bridges are not fancy enough or interesting enough. Those are really good too, but I felt that I want to do something different that not many people have uh, tried to do. So I chose, okay, let me try offshore structures. And and I like steel design. And uh, so I thought, okay, okay, let, let's let try, let's learn more about offshore oil and gas platform, what goes they use, how they design them, and learn some software that industry uses and uh, get some knowledge in that area. So it's very, it's there is no any specific reason, not specific. The only reason I could think why I chose is because I want to do something different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that definitely seems different. Yeah, that's all. I, I don't know too much about offshore structures either. Are those those oil platforms out in the middle of the ocean or? Yes. Is that the main type of structure? Yes, exactly. And of course, these structures now are being used to house the uh, wind turbines too. Now we are moving to the oh. renewable energy. So actually some of, actually some of these uh Jacket platforms, which are housing the uh, oil and gas platforms, uh, now are, some of them are going to be reused and being used be reused for um, wind turbine to to house the wind turbine structure. So yeah, so that's why and that's how I chose that topic for my masters, and uh, yeah, yeah. I got interested in it. And you know what? There is, uh, of course, there are a lot of similarities. It's it, this uh, offshore jacket platform is this just basically a three D truss structure. In a, in a very aggressive environment. So what makes it unique is just the environment in which it is placed and the the uncertainty associated with the loads and stuff, which makes it challenging to kind of optimize the structure because we tend to, since it is uncertain enough, you, you put more safety factor and you end up with a large member sizes and stuff. So that makes it unique and challenging with respect to uh, offshore platforms, I feel because of the uncertainty associated with the loads and uh, how you use that to design efficiently and uh, economically. Yeah, that seems really, now that I'm thinking about it, it does seem really interesting in terms of, okay, it's out in the middle of the ocean, the loads, could storms and tsunamis hit? And, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. What happens? Exactly. <laughs> and it just drift off from the foundations? or <laughs> Exactly. And uh, and. Um, Many of these are like, in, so many of them are there in Norway region and where everything freezes. And what happens oh, yeah. when the ice breaks and it hits hits the all those uh, members, thin members, and all those are very really interesting things to look at in this particular uh, niche field of offshore structures. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. And I know you did some some work on on machine learning. Could you talk about that? I think you, you did. You do that in your PhD or. What what things can we learn from machine learning? Because I'm still new with the AI and machine learning. So <laughs> well, I'm not <laughs> an expert good. in machine learning either. But uh, yes, I mean the machine learning is uh, deep rooted. It's, it's basically all your statistics and probability. All those are the fundamentals or the building blocks of machine learning itself. And all those algorithms and optimization, what which we have all seen and we have heard of and we have used in our problems. All those are uh, the backbones of the machine learning. So the stat I would say the statistical analysis and machine learning are in some way tied. And how I use machine learning is literally, again, it is a data-driven uh, models. I mean, these models need data uh, and you use the data to develop the model. So when I was looking at what different type of uh, deterioration models I can uh, try, I saw that uh, since at the time machine learning was really coming up and uh, so many, what to say, so many um, publications in other fields, especially the field of computer science are already out there. I was thinking, why can't we take that into our civil engineering field and uh, try to 
use that concept and you bring something useful for our field. So that's how I tried that employing machine learning models. I used the artificial neural network model for uh, developing the bridge deterioration to model the bridge deterioration. So, and uh, the these models are heavily driven by the data that we use. And again, this data, what I used was from the National Bridge Inventory records. Yes, and uh, yes. I think the advantage of machine learning model is uh, it can handle uh, a huge data set and uh, it you some some of the things cannot be explicitly modeled. For example, it's not a simple y is equal to a plus px, a straight line or a y is equal to e x squared plus something. It cannot be uh, simplified in a in an explicit mathematical formula. So in that case, if you have too many input parameters, how do you understand the relation between them? So that's where machine learning helps you and that's where it's useful. So sometimes people also say machine learning is a black box <laughs> because we really do not know what's happening inside it. But I don't think it is a black box fully. And uh, there is a way that we can understand what's going on in these models. And um, currently, a lot of uh, physics-inspired machine learning is is the trend now in uh, structural engineering field. And uh, yes, so the advantage of machine learning models is when you can't explicitly model it, in an equation as an equation and you have too many input parameters and you want to know the relation between them that's where uh, and you want to predict it's it's more it's more of a prediction tool and you have a certain set, set of data and you know the data behaves in a certain way you have certain input parameters you know okay for these input parameters i have this output now what if i give some other input parameters and after so many years how that what will be the condition of the for example in the bridge condition rating I have the bridge condition, say, for example, 30 years back, I have the condition. And then up to from 30 years until now, I have all the data. Now, how can I use all this data with all the input parameters like the bridge deck, uh, width, number of spans and material type and all those things, the location, so many things. With all those input parameters, how can I predict what will be the condition of that bridge, say, after five years, after 10 years? That's where the machine learning model helps in. That's the advantage of it. When you can't explicitly model the equation and you have a huge data set and you have too many input parameters that you want to utilize and predict your output. Uh, okay. Yeah. So going back to your bridge example, it's you have all this data and from different types of bridges too. So if you have a specific bridge, uh, the machine has already looked at a bunch of data and based on those parameters, like, oh yeah, it's a two-span bridge with, with these types of environmental conditions. Based on all the other bridges and data, I can interpolate that it's going to be deteriorated in X amount of years based on all this other data. It's not actually doing uh, an equation, right? It's it's based on all the data, it can interpolate, oh yeah, it's probably going to probably. look like this Probably, yes, that's a very important word, probably. The probability is the is the heart of machine learning. You always get a, it's, it's okay, what is the probability that this answer is correct? For example, what's the probability that the condition of the bridge will stay good for the next five years? So this probability is a very, very key thing to machine learning. And everything, you cannot say, okay, this is what it is. There is always an average and there is always a standard deviation. There is a, there is a range with which we you, you have to tell an uh, output parameter. And also everything, Whatever we say is connected to the probability. What is the probability that the bridge will deteriorate in ten in ten years from now? What is the probability that the timber bridge will deteriorate? What is the probability that the concrete bridge will deteriorate? What is the probability that the concrete concrete bridge with so many spans will deteriorate in in five years in this environment? So that's exactly the key thing in machine learning: the probability. Yeah, that's really cool. I think that's going to be really useful. I think even some of the bigger structural engineering firms out in the world, I think, because they have so much data, for example, for buildings. They've done all sorts of buildings and probably refeed buildings. So for example, I'm envisioning, okay, we're going to have a five-story building made out of concrete based on all the other structures that we did because we've done so many projects. We have all that, or we have all that data and you can, you actually get it into data format. Then you could like press a button and say, probably for schematic design, yes. early phases, we're probably going to have 18 by 18 columns yes. or 12 inch slabs or 
whatever. And I think that's, I think some firms, those big firms are already doing that yes. type of stuff. And it seems like that's the machine learning, uh, not too clear with the nomenclature, but <laughs> they're using data. <laughs> exactly. Using data somehow. <laughs> exactly. Using data smartly is machine learning. Yeah. 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 That's really interesting. And for just one last question for that one. How hard is it to learn machine learning for, let's say, a, an engineer that's working in the industry? It's like, you got to learn programming and all this stuff, or is it kind of just, oh, just take some online courses and you should be able to figure it out? <laughs> you need to take a project-based course. If at all, um, it's a course if that needs to be a project, then oh, definitely we need to learn some language to implement it. So either a Python or an R. I used R, a statistical software, a lot for my research. So definitely one of the languages so now gotcha. you don't need to do, learn so many things. Just one of them and understand the concept how to implement because we need a tool to implement our ideas. So that's that's yeah. why you, could, you need to learn a language. So yeah. Yeah, and I see, I know you're not just an engineer, but you also do a lot of creative things on the side, such as I believe you're a trained Indian classical vocalist and educator. Could you tell me more about that and how do you balance all that stuff? Yeah, sure. So I was I got into music right from my uh, childhood. So again, it's it's like a push and uh, drive given by mom, especially from my mom. She put me into music classes while I was too young and uh, I started learning in classical music. And as of as with everything else, again, it's it was an organic process. I never thought I wanted to be a stage performer. I wanted to be a teacher or an educator in that. Nothing of that sort. I just kept learning, 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 learning. And uh, I have wonderful teacher, music teacher who, who supports me and uh, who keeps motivating me. And um, I think uh, it organically led me into the path where I am. And uh, it's interesting to have there's two different parallel tracks going in my life, instructional engineering and music. So, and uh, like, I feel really grateful that I have had that opportunity to learn music and uh, and pursue that. Yeah, yeah. I, I often find it for people with hobbies, even the things that they're really passionate about, even with engineering, I think it, for me at least, it, it, when I have these hobbies and, and different things that I'm passionate about that aside from work, I think that really balances it out. I mean, I think, uh, you know, some people ask, like, how, how do you, how do you balance that stuff? And I, it, it gets it, automatically balanced. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it. I think that's the thing, right? When you, maybe you're stressed out from work, and then yes. how do you balance out the stress? Well, you go do something that you're you're really passionate about, and yeah. then yeah, that's how that's where the balance comes in. I think you, true. you can't just work all the time. It's, that's you, true. And you also, find these things. and it's very true. As you rightly said, it's, it's just getting a break from something that you have been doing uh, for a long hours. Right. And then it, it just gives you fresh perspective and motivation and get back again on the, on the task. So I think it, as you say, uh, as you said, rightly, it, it balances itself. It's not that we allocate a special time to put an effort and uh, really struggle to balance. It's just it balances itself. Um, if you have both these passions, then automatically we, we end up allocating time and spending time on both of these. And one gives energy to do other. If, if you're yeah. bored with music, do engineering. If you're bored with engineering, do music, something like that. So it, there is no dull moment. Keep, uh... Exactly. Yeah, and Aish, uh, just to end off, do you have any final advice for structural engineers that are in their career paths? I would probably uh, uh, say the advice that I received from all the mentors and uh, teachers that uh, who have guided me. Uh, one of the things during my PhD program, especially, this is coming from my professor, Arakya Sami. So he, he's like during my initial phases, at least the first two, three years, um, I used to be uh, like so excited when you, when I when I get an idea and uh, it... also when, and also it goes the other way too. I, when I try out something a lot and I don't get it, I, I become so frustrated and sometimes have some tears. Why am I not getting it? <laughs> so I had all this, what to say, the extreme emotions coming in. So my professor observed me a couple of times and she told he told me that, well, try to keep your mind without excitement or agitation. So that's that's a very important piece of advice, I think, which helped me. And uh, I really um, feel grateful that he uh, told me up front and uh, it molded me. And, and another advice that I received, again, during 
my PhD program from one of uh, one of my committee members, Professor Dr. Dari Russell. So he was mentioning at one point of time when we were interacting, he was mentioning that you need to develop the skill of zooming in and zooming out, uh, meaning that uh, uh, when you look at a problem, okay, you look at a problem from a, from a bigger perspective, you understand the 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 higher perspective and um, overall objective and idea, and you get into details, details, details. But when you get into details, 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 you have to make sure to go back and see whether all those details and the solutions that you are digging into and looking into, is it it is it matching with your overall goal? So that was an, another advice uh, I received from my professor. And uh, another interesting advice uh, that I received a long time back during my high school from my high school, high school principal, uh, Mr. Purna Chandran. So he used to tell us, always follow a book of mistakes. When you make a mistake, make sure you, you note that down so that you are aware of it and you don't repeat it. And that really helped me. And uh, sometimes I still use a book of mistakes where anything I... I made a error here. Okay, this I should not. I should follow in this approach. I should look at this particular reference. I should. I should not make this mistake. So all those things, I I keep a tab of it. So I think this is. These are the three main things which I learned from uh, from my advisors and from my teachers. There are many more, but uh, so many teachers have contributed. But this is just a small piece of it. But personally, if I were to give an advice, I would say that anybody just. Try to do your current task properly. Give your best in what you take up and what you do. And uh, don't be overly concerned of uh, of what will happen and stuff. And uh, try plan for the future, but focus more on the present and focus on the process. Because if we have the right process, the right approach, and if we, if we focus on the present, then the future will take care of itself. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I love that advice. Uh, I really resonate with, the, with your first one with the learning how to or being aware to respond instead of react where you feel frustrated is like wait you're frustrated okay why do you feel frustrated how 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 are you responding being mindful in that moment of okay i'm really frustrated right now or i'm really stressed out taking a step back uh, even with detaching in terms of okay here's how here's the problem i know it, how are you going to solve it? Seeing what the big picture is, does does it align with your goals? So I think well, that's great advice. And yeah, being in the moment, I think focus on one task at a time. Things take time. And if you do complete one step, focus one step at a time, it'll it'll get you to where you want to go. So right. thanks so much for, for uh, giving us that. Thank you so much for uh, giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts and experiences. And I love talking with you and interacting in this podcast. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources or websites mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.